Clear prop. Star 73, Cherokee number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's one Charlie Bravo, race for Denver, runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I am fantastic as always. This is part three to Common Checkride Errors. We've recorded part one and part two a couple weeks ago. We released our live at Eastern Kentucky University since then. Pat has been to Fun and Sun. Wally's been to Hawaii two or three times. And here we are back in Houston, Texas, all remote. Wally happens to be in Denver tonight while we record this part three episode. Pat Brown, welcome back to the show for... Five, six, seven, eight times now. Thanks for coming again. Live and direct from Memorial. There you go. <laughs> so last couple episodes, we talked a lot about private checkride stuff, common errors. Those common errors probably span a n- number of different types of check rides. But we in part two, we, we were coming back, landing at the airport. The, the private check ride was pretty much over. And we're going to jump right into commercial stuff tonight. So commercial check ride stuff. Let's start with the oral, guys. Um, you, I remember my oral like it was not that long ago because it wasn't. But uh, what, what, what do you see where commercial applicants maybe struggle or make mistakes in the oral portion of the commercial check ride? Let, let me just start by saying, you know, I think what we have to understand is, is as commercial applicants, we, you know, uh, assuming everything goes well, you're going to get a commercial pilot certificate at the end of the check ride, and you're going to be legal to go out tomorrow and accept money, and uh, you know, maybe a, a a private corporation that that owns an airplane for which you are you know, appropriately rated single engine land, or, you know, could be multi-engine land. That's a big deal. That is really a big deal. I mean, that is like, uh, you know, a doctor graduating from medical school and them saying, okay, doctor, Dr. Brown, you can go out and start injecting people with medicine. You can start cutting them open and taking organs out. You can, uh, you know, you can practice medicine on people now. Um, and that's in a sense what we're saying to people is you can go do this professionally and get paid for it. So is the standard higher? It absolutely is, and as it should be. So I think I think people just uh, I don't know they they're 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 a little bit uh, you know they when, when I when I might say okay that that does not meet the standard there you know they they want to say well it was close enough or it was good enough but you know the standard for a commercial pilot needs to be pretty high yeah i would agree if i'm riding with any of them i want it to be pretty high yeah you know when i don't remember if i told the story in the last couple of um common errors things but uh if i did bear with me we've got maybe different listeners but I remember doing a, uh, it was a check ride several weeks ago. I don't honestly don't remember if it was an instrument check ride or a, it was a commercial check. It was a commercial check ride. And we entered the traffic pattern at West Houston Airport at 1,200 feet. And the traffic pattern is 1,100 feet. And I didn't say anything until you got on the downwind. And I finally said, you know, what's the traffic pattern altitude? He said 1,100 feet. And I said, well, why are we at 12? He said, well, I just, I feel better at 1,200 feet. I feel safer. So, okay. I kind of left it at that. Um, and, and then he added this. It's, it's, it's only 100 feet. Okay. So I just kind of made a little note of that. And then during the debrief afterwards, I said to him, so let's talk about that downwind leg. You know, when you mentioned about, uh, you know, it's only 100 feet, um, so I thought, I, th- I thought that was interesting. So, you know, you and I are flying an instrument approach into West Houston Airport and the MDA uh, for, uh, for the approach is 560 feet. But, you know, I know the terrain pretty good. So I'm just going to go on down to 460 feet because, hey, it's only 100 feet. 
and you can see the light go on in his head like oh <laughs> i get it so yeah. uh, to your point wally uh the little, the little things count yeah just, just for the heck of it next time you get your electric bill when you pay the bill short them ten dollars and just when they call you just say it's only ten dollars and then <laughs> we'll see what they say you won't have lights for long right wally right right you know another thing is uh is understanding some of the nuances of the airworthiness of the airplane. Um, you know, in some of the scenarios I use, um, the uh, the applicant is flying my personal airplane. I'm not a pilot, but I've hired the applicant to fly my personal airplane on a trip somewhere. And you know, and, and I'll ask them, well, how you know, how do you know my airplane is airworthy? And, um, and, you know, they'll say, well, um, you know, they'll go through the arrow documents and the various things. And then I might say something like, uh, okay, uh, but as you're pre-flighting, you see that there's, a, you know, one of the fuel placards is missing on the wing. Is the airplane legally airworthy without that fuel placard? And, oh boy. You know, it, it, now they now they're struggling. Now they're now they're thinking. Well, it's a minimum equipment list, or it's. I mean, they're looking. They're looking all kinds of crazy places. Looking the regs. They're looking all kinds of pla crazy crazy places. And so where they should be looking in in the limitations section to see what the required placards are. So those are that's that's one thing that that I find is is kind of a a weakness in really understanding some of the nuances of of uh, of that, um, on occasion, on occasion, um, we'll talk about coming back at night and the landing light burns out. And um, okay, so is the air, airplane legally airworthy? And they'll say, no, the airplane, no, it's not, it's because it, you know, it's for hire. And said, is it? it? Is it really for? Right. Yeah, you're you're hiring me to fly. Okay, but is the airplane for hire? <laughs> Right. So some of those little nuances um, and whether or not the airplane requires 100 hours. I mean, there's some real nuances as to whether the airplane requires 100 hours as to whether it's being used for instruction or, or not for flight instructions. Is there a rental? What if it's a rental, but it's not ever being used for flight instruction? It doesn't require 100 hours. Right. So, you know, there's there are those those a lot of that kind of stuff. I see just a lot of I don't want to use the word ignorance because that's too strong, but certainly unfamiliarity with some of those nuances. Would you agree, Wally? I, I, I definitely agree with that. And um, yeah, it's, and it's, it makes some, for some very interesting Saturday morning coffee discussion too. It, it really does. Um, you know, something else I would say, and, and this is just a bit of advice. What I, I see quite a few commercial applicants uh, coming in with without a valid first or second class medical they have a third it's it's lapsed or maybe it's just a third class medical and and that's that's legal that's okay we can take a check ride you just can't exercise the privileges until you have at least a second class medical and so uh, i i will typically uh say to the applicant i say okay let's say to, we everything goes well today we pass the check ride and um, and Bob calls you up tomorrow, and he wants you to hire to hire you to fly his corporate Piper Warrior. Are you legal to do that? And uh, you, most of the people will say, uh, "Yes, I am." And I'll say, "Well, okay, based on everything you have in your pocket, you're legal to do that." And we get, we get into the talk of the the medical. Um, and at the end of the check ride, my advice to people is. If you're going to be a commercial pilot, have a valid medical. And when I say valid, I mean a second class. And, and my point is, aviation is, is a weird industry. You may be sitting around and some guy comes in and says, man, I just bought an airplane up in Seattle. I need someone to go and, and bring it back for me. I'm willing to pay $500 a day. My flight instructor got sick. Um, we've got we're booked on a flight tomorrow morning. Who can go with me? And uh, without that medical, you can't do it. And um, 
I don't know. I, I, I've never, I've never let mine, you know, go back to a third class. So I'd say if you're going to be a commercial pilot, keep that medical up. You just never know. No question. What, what about, um, I guess high altitude oxygen stuff that you might talk about in the oral with a commercial applicant. Do they struggle with that? Uh, It's, there's a few nuances. It's probably on every commercial cheat sheet in the world, but what, what do y'all see specific to the oral that maybe commercial applicants struggle with? I, I actually, I, mine are pretty good. Um, I do ask them about the uh, oxygen uh, requirements. I, I will, I'll put them in a situation where they're, they're flying for a company that, that, that has a, a, whatever airplane we're using on the checklist uh, on the check ride. And then I'll say, okay, let's say the, the, uh, the owner of the airplane buys a, a, uh, turbocharged Beechcraft Bonanza, which is high performance and complex. And we'll, we'll get into what endorsements we need for that. And I'll say, okay, uh, can we fly from here to there at a given altitude? You know, what are the oxygen, implications of that and i actually i'm pretty impressed with 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 the applicants i have most of them know it very well yeah Good. i'd say the same thing i don't have a real problem with that at all all right anything else in the oral that uh can, can cause problems that you guys want to talk about i will i will say this talking about the oxygen thing uh, if, if you, you the listeners want to watch a pretty funny video on uh, YouTube. If you Google David Letterman, Tom Cruise airplane story, it's about a five minute video um, where David Letterman is interviewing Tom Cruise and uh, they don't talk about airplanes until about two minutes into it. So you got to bear with it, but uh, it's, it's just, just do that. Just Google or, or go to YouTube and, and put in David Letterman, Tom Cruise airplane story. It's pretty funny. It is funny for sure. I'm making note of that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we go from the oral like we do in all these check rides. We've obviously checked the weather. We're going out to the aircraft. We start the aircraft. We're heading to wherever we're going to go. And it's time to work on some maneuvers. Let's talk about the specific maneuvers. We've talked about the private stuff, and I would assume all things are equal from a private check ride, steep turns, all those things. Still the common errors exist for commercial pilots. Maybe the standards are slightly different, but those things still apply. Let's talk about the specific maneuvers to commercial. And I'm going to assume I think I did a Shondell first. Let's talk Shondells. All right, Wally, you want to you want to take a shot at it first? Well, well, let me let me go back Be, before we even get to that. Um, I, I don't know how other people do it, but um, there is still on the commercial in the, the commercial ACS there is a, a cross country phase to the check ride, if you will, and uh, some I, 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 I there might be a deficiency in flight instructing. There might be uh, I don't know, but. But a lot of people, uh, you know, of course, I give them a cross country. And, and when I say, okay, we're going to actually go out and fly this cross country, they look at me like I got, you know, things growing out, out of my ears. I go, really? We're, we're not just going to go out and do maneuvers? No, absolutely. We're going we're gonna to do um, the commercial phase of it. And it is. You mean, Wally, decent. we're going all the way to Colorado? Come on, man. Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> we're. And, and we're going to use pilotage and we're going to use, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to use those pre-computed uh, headings and, and times that you came up with. Um, and yeah, I mean, is it realistic? Because most of the time the applicant is instrument rated. Is it realistic? They're, they're going to fly a, a two, three, 400 mile flight VFR. Um, probably not. Okay, I, I would I would think most people would file IFR and go, um, but this is part of of the ACS, and I I think a lot of flight instructors when they get a commercial applicant, they just kind of think they just assume that the 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 applicant is is proficient in that area. It might be 
might be something worth dusting the cobwebs off of. You know, that's that's a, a good point. And as you were talking about that, it also um, brought up the idea, are we using four flight or some device like that, or are we using paper? And, you know, while I actually, I prefer to see somebody bring paper to the check ride, just because personally, for me, it's easier to lay out the charts and kind of get the big picture and you can talk about the trip in total. But if they come with four flight instead of paper charts, that's fine. It's, it's, it's perfectly okay. It's perfectly legal. But I'm going to start peppering them with some questions about four flight at this point, you know, and how, in other words, how did you come up with the course of the heading that you're going to be flying, you know, the magnetic heading that you're going to be flying? How is that calculated in four flight? What's included? What's not? Is wind included? Is it not? Um, and, you know, if, if wind is included, how do we how do we take wind out of the, of the picture? And there's ways to do that. But, you know, how much do they understand about about four flight and the way those numbers are calculated? Um, uh, that, that tells you a lot right there. No question. And that did get me in the uh, my commercial from a standpoint of a, a better conversation. I was able to uh, answer the questions, but it really did, you know, when did I create that flight plan that I printed out and were the winds based on forecasted winds, current winds, et cetera. And you really need to understand that if you're going to use those headings for your compass in case of something else failing, for sure. You need to know that. Yeah, exactly. Because you can rest assured those questions are going to be in the oral if you come and you're using for flight for the oral portion of the, of the cross country discussion in the, in the oral. All right. So um, let's talk Shondells. I think, uh, I don't remember if I said it to you, Wally, or someone else, but I think a, a trick that someone told me was always do your left Shondell first. Left turning tendencies will always help you. Do you guys make a person turn one way or the other? You let them always pick? What's your mode of operandus for Shondells? And is there a common mistake that applicants need to be uh, uh, aware of i i let the, uh, i let them pick um and i don't know if i've ever had anybody done it right <laughs> surprise yeah i'd say the same thing i don't i don't really care whether they go left or right but typically speaking they'll go left first um it's, it's easier no question yeah and it is a performance maneuver, so we are trying to um, we are trying to get some performance. So, yeah. But you know, as far there, as common mistakes, I mean, they're probably pretty. Um, um, you're probably pretty intuitive as far as what you might expect. Pitching up too much to begin with, um, realizing that they've done so as they're rolling out of the maneuver, at which point it's supposed to be a constant pitch. Uh, constant pitch changing bank maneuver uh, and the lowering the nose because they're afraid they're going to stall before they get to the 180 degree mark. Um, right. that, that's a big one right there. Right. Yeah. I don't remember having a lot of trouble with Shondells, but um, I think once I learned the maneuver and understood really what we were trying to accomplish, it's a math equation, right? You're trying to get to a certain point in a certain part of the turn and, if you do that, then you're probably going to be fairly successful in that maneuver. And um, waiting, waiting too late to start your rollout um, and then being a little bit too aggressive on trying to roll out. Um, I see that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, generally speaking, the applicants do the Sean Dells reasonably well. Okay. And, and it, the, the other thing is it, it, it really is a visual maneuver. You know, this isn't uh, an IFR maneuver where you're just uh, head head inside. And so, um, I don't know. I, I would say on this maneuver, maybe you ought to be 80% out, 20% in. You know, just, just I, I don't know. That, that's just, there's nothing in the ACS that says how much. But, um, you know, you ought to be looking outside. The other way around would definitely be wrong. 80 in and 20 out, right? I mean, you're definitely, oh, yeah. you're definitely oh, looking yeah. out. You definitely have to see yeah. something. Yeah. Um, the next one, the next commercial maneuver that I think of is, is lazy eights. And I, 
I've said this many times about being a multi-engine applicant and, and passing that and feeling like a real pilot when I became a multi-engine pilot. But I remember when I really felt, when I really felt the plane and myself doing good lazy eights, I felt like, man, this all just kind of clicks. Like finally I got it. Um, I know what the plane wants to do. I know what it's supposed to feel like, but I'm sure you guys have been on some crazy lazy eights. <laughs> Not quite so smooth, I should crazy, say. Crazy eights. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, eights. yeah, yeah. When I was, you know, when I when I was doing my commercial uh, training, and this is back in the dark ages, when you could actually use a Cessna 150 to do it, and you didn't need any, um, uh, didn't need any complex uh, or high performance time. Um, uh, m- m- it was basically a wing over. Yeah. Basically a wing over. I mean, and we're, we're talking about a 60 degree bank. And, wow, uh, that was the way I was taught to do lazy eights. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, of course now, and, and the thing about it is the, the, the problem with the ACS in, in, in my view with lazy eights is that it, it doesn't adequately describe really what that maneuver should look like. Um, it says, you know, approximately a 30 degree bank at the, at the steepest and okay, approximately 30 degrees, you know, 45 degrees is not approximately 30. So we can, I think we can agree on that, but um, it, it doesn't really talk about the, the pitch angle uh, at, at that first 45, which really ought to bring you down within, I don't know, Ollie, what would you say? Five to 10 knots of stall anyway. Uh, yeah, to have the appropriate pitch angle so that the airplane actually kind of just falls through the horizon at the 90 degree mark on its own. Yeah. But all too often I see, you know, just a maybe a 15 degree pitch up or something like that. And then, of course, we don't lose enough airspeed and the applicant ends up driving the airplane through the maneuver. Yeah. And so did they do the did they do what what was described in the ACS? Yeah. But is it really what that maneuver is supposed to look like? Not really. And I, I attribute that basically, basically just to babies teaching babies. Right. Mm-hmm. And just that, uh, you know, I, I learned it to do, I learned to do it that way because that's the way my instructor uh, learned how to do it. And I had the instructor does it that way because that's the way he was taught how to do it. And, how, and then she was taught, you know, but, and it just, it just, it, it, it's just babies teaching babies. And, and, and so uh, this is where, where I really wish as DPEs, we were allowed to um, engage in some form of flight instruction after the applicant has demonstrated the maneuver either successfully right. or otherwise, but because we just, we just don't have a chance to fix those mistakes. And it's hard to describe those things when you're, when you're sitting on the ground um, and, and kind of make them see what it is that, that they're doing wrong, because according to the ACS, they're not really doing it wrong, but it's not right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, yeah I, my, I, sorry. Well, my instructor, okay. his name was Travis and uh, we did all my commercial maneuver stuff and, it was one of his demonstrations where I think I really felt the plane for the first time really fall, but not be afraid that it was falling through that 90 degree point. Right. And then it, you, you could almost hear the wind, you could hear the plane kind of cutting through the air. And I just felt like this was really the first time that I really felt, I felt and knew what it was supposed to feel like. I felt knew what the, the maneuver was supposed to do. And then I could repeat that. And Maybe that's part of what you're saying, Pat, is that maybe kids teaching kids or children teaching children that you, there's something that's missed if it's not taught the right way. But uh, really is my favorite maneuver now from that standpoint, because when you do it right, it is almost like a dance. It is. It's a ballet. It's a beautiful maneuver when it's done properly. And, and the operative word in the name of the maneuver is lazy. Lazy. And and I'll I'll tell on myself. It was probably nine years ago. I was getting a basically a check ride with the FAA to become a DPE, and this is one of the maneuvers we did was lazy eights. And 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 the FAA guy said, uh, he said, let let's see if you can make it lazier. And I went, I went oh yeah okay. And then he goes, yeah yeah that's it. And 
And uh, oh, geez, we ought to call these things lazy eights. Oh, wait a minute, we do call them lazy eights. So yeah, it's just a nice, uh, uh, yeah, they're they're fun to do. Yeah, I like them too. Next big one, sometimes confused because it also has an eight in it. Eights on pylons. Man, pivotal altitude, all kinds of crazy stuff we got to learn and know. And boy. This one's this one's probably the hard one. I don't know. Y'all tell me. This one is the one I assume people struggle with. This in the next one probably, but let's start with this one. Uh, eights on pylons. What, what do y'all see? If well, I mean, if they understand the purpose of the maneuver, um, then I, I don't think they struggle quite as much. Um, one of the things that I'll ask them is, you know, what's our pivotal altitude? And almost to a person, they pull out this nicely prepared chart um you know if it's 90 knots it's this and it's 100 knots it's that and i said well but but, but how do we how did we do how do we come up with that number you know, what's the formula and yeah. they should know that you know it's a, right. i mean it, you might consider it a piece of trivia but they should know that and um you know if, they're, if the ride's going reasonably well and they don't know the formula i'm not going to bust them for it but it will certainly be a part of the debrief yeah yeah what about picking points? Is picking points something you see people? I mean, I've heard crazy stories. Um, we're all familiar with probably the West practice area in this part of Houston, but you know, there's a glider port out there to like the glider port could, should not be one of your pylons, of course. Right. But I mean, there's, there's probably some bad choices, I assume. Well, I would, I will say this. I have flown halfway to Dallas looking for the two perfect points on check rides. <laughs> and, so uh, what I'd like to be, see people do is pick one point, start the maneuver, and when they roll out, look the other way, and you're going to find something. There will be something out there. You know, the, the, the Says edge, the 25,000-hour pilot. I mean, come on. That's a, that's a little stretch for someone. But I think I, – I don't think so. I don't think that's so at all. Either. Good. Good challenge then, for sure. I think we've all, you know – uh, okay, uh, those two, no, they're too close. Or, or, or even, you know, after they pick two, they may roll out and realize that that second point was, was too far away or, or too close. It's, it's not ideal. And, you know, a lot of times they'll say, oh, I'm going to change it to the, the blue house. Okay. All right. But, uh, you know, just, uh, as I say, just roll out and, and something will find you. There's going to be something out there. You're absolutely right, Wally, and 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 I, like you, I've you know probably flown halfway to Mexico looking for <laughs> looking for a point, but uh, um, I I had an applicant one time start the lazy eights on the right turn, figuring that it would be easier to find a point off the left wing when they were all wings level. And I never thought about that. And there's nothing in the ACS that says that they have to start with a left turn. So, yeah. so I thought, you know, something that's really smart because yeah. finding that point off the right wing, sometimes it can be a challenge, yeah. but boy, when you roll wings level and you'd look off your left wing, and as you said, there will be something there. It might be a clump of grass. It might yeah. be a, it might be a corner of a ditch. It might be a cow. And I, right. I tell, I tell, I don't care if it's a cow, as long as the cow's not walking. You know, right. it makes no difference to me. And but the other, the, but the, but, but beyond that, um, the, 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 the errors that I see are kind of, I guess, generic in nature. And that is not anticipating what's coming based on where the wind is coming from. And so right. they're flying the maneuver in more of a reactive way than a proactive way, if that makes sense. They wait till they see that motion happening on the wing before they push or pull. When if they really, if they really understand where the wind is coming from, or reasonably sure where the wind is coming from, and today with some of these glass cockpits that have the wind vector this this, this display right there, uh, but anyway, if they're if they're reasonably sure where the wind is coming from, then they should start anticipating that they're going to have to start pulling or pushing at some point and start doing that. Um, you know, kind of almost. Uh, 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 well, really just anticipating what's coming and doing it in advance rather than being reactive, if that makes any sense. Right, right. 
you know, with, with all of these maneuvers, you know, th probably the first thing is clear the area. Yeah, and and I I I like to use the phrase clear the area rather than clearing turns because I think when we say clearing turns, we go out there and we do two ninety degree turns looking at the instruments. All purpose to, is to look outside. So. So I, I try to say, let's, you know, if, if I'm instructing, I always say, let's clear the area. The way we do that is with clearing turns. Yeah, that's a good point. This could be a tough question for you, but uh, I'll ask because I'm sure the listeners wonder, is this a maneuver where people fail check rides on? Is this the hard one? Is this the tough one? Is this where the weaknesses are shown? Well, go ahead, Ron. I, I, I have put uh, eight some pylons on a notice of disapproval. I have. Um, I can't say that if everything is great um, uh, and uh, I can't say this, ah, you know, if you don't meet the standard, you don't meet the standard. But um, uh, usually if they're having trouble with this, they're having trouble with other things. Gotcha. You know, I, I would, I'd say the same thing. Uh, it's 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 rare that that the uh, eights on pylons alone will be on the notice of disapproval. Um, right. But yeah. I but but I have um, I have um, uh, called a disapproval based solely on the eights on pylons uh, if they're horrible enough. Right. <laughs> Makes sense. Let's talk about the one I, I, I'll I rat myself out. I think I struggle, struggled with steep spirals. Uh, I did a lot of my commercial stuff in an arrow. It was like a lawn dart. Obviously, it was hard to, you know, hard to make all those turns and um, not lose all that altitude. So I think this is just one where I think you're really learning how, how good you have to be at controlling the aircraft in your commercial training. And probably one I assume again, with with a with a little bit of wind, is something where uh, pilots that aren't really good at their task probably struggle. What are y'all thoughts on steep spirals? Well, uh, first of all, let me ask you about that arrow. What'd you have to do? Start at like twelve thousand feet or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. No, I had to like turn at eighty degrees a bank just so I get three laps, three circles in. But um, yeah, it was a lawn dart. There's no question. It was tough. Go, go ahead, Wally. You start. You go ahead with this one. No, and I, I would say this is probably a maneuver that um, the applicants probably haven't done this very much. And it, just from the standpoint is you get to you got to get pretty high, and at least where we are in the sun, it's usually hot, and especially in the summer, it takes a long time to get up there. So I think. Um, Maybe we overlook this one. Yeah, I think I think you're right, and, and it's it's not only does it take a long time to get up there, it, you may well not be able to get up there, depending right. on the altitude that's necessary. I mean, I, I don't know if I remember right, somewhere around four thousand feet, forty five hundred feet. If you're really going to make three full three sixties, yeah, and level off above fifteen hundred feet, um, you're going to have to be at 4,500 feet, depending on the airplane. And if it's in the arrow, it's probably closer to six. I mean, I was joking with the 12,000, but, but you probably got to be at six uh, with the arrow. And that's awfully hard to do um, down in this part of the country sometimes. No question. Is it, is it the wind? Is it the turning? Is it the, that I got to do three of those laps. Where do you see the struggles for applicants come in? I know I'm making it very general, but you guys have sat in that seat a lot. What do you see people struggle with on this maneuver? Uh, pick, well, picking a point is one, and the biggest mistake that they make is treating it like, I'll say like a turnabout a point. Um, in other words, picking a point that might be you know, halfway out the wing or something like that. Well, if if the point from your perspective, if you're at 4,000 or 5,000 feet and that point is halfway out the wing, then that point is probably, I don't know, four or five miles away from you. Yeah. And so what you have to do is you actually have to kind of get your 
forehead up against the side glass on the airplane and look straight down. And that's going to be your point. Yeah. I mean, literally straight down. Right. And, you know, I, I, I actually, Wally, I was talking to one of our fellow examiners a number of years ago because I was having fits trying to teach people this particular maneuver. And he gave me a piece of advice, which I have held to ever since and found that that, that was so helpful. Um, but that was either to find, like to find an airport, for example, sport flyers, that's probably not a good example, it's, it's too close to class problem, but like a, a Fairweather or some, someplace like that, um, and actually fly a downwind leg with the airport directly below you. I mean, looking straight down at it and almost treat the steep spiral as you would treat a downwind uh, cross, a downwind base, upwind crosswind, downwind base, upwind crosswind, uh, as you're circling down over the airport. In other words, almost treat it like you're making an emergency descent to the airport, which is really what that maneuver is. Right. And, it's, and it, so, but what I found is if you can't find an airport, then find a tree line or find a, a long ditch or something like that, that you can kind of imagine is an airport and then just fly a regular traffic pattern around it because the ACS says that you got to vary the bank according to the wind. So nowhere does it say it has to be a perfect circle. It simply says you had, because if you're varying the bank according to the wind, it's not necessarily going to be a perfect circle anyway. And how are we going to know if it's a perfect circle or 4,000 feet? So, if, you know, that's a that's kind of a hack that uh, one of our fellow examiners told me about years and years ago that I found was really helpful in steep spirals. Yeah, that's good. Very I interesting. like that. Wally, what I mean, what 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 are your thoughts? No, I agree with every, everything you said, and and uh, uh, now I want to go out and try that that uh, that traffic pattern thing that you just talked about i'd never heard that but that's good like the other episodes this one has gotten long as well and we're gonna have to come back and do instrument later on but let's make the last one the but the the final one how about the power off 180s i'm sure you've never had an applicant not complete the power off 180 what are the big mistakes what what can we do to share some tips and tricks to help those future applicants out there be better at power off 180s strikes fear in their hearts, doesn't it? What do you, <laughs> yeah. What yeah. do you say, Wally? Well, I do not do the power off 180 um, early in the landing phase. So I let the applicant kind of get their feet wet with where's the wind coming from. Um, you know, we're going to do a short field landing before we do a power off 180. And, uh, you know, almost treat the the short field landing sort of like a power off 180 but you know you get a you do uh you know you do have the ability to add power and uh even go around on a, the the uh, short field landing um but use that as your measuring stick um also you know you you got you you probably not a good idea to do your check ride in 20 knots of headwind when you've never practiced man this maneuver in 20 knots of headwind. Um, so, so use some, you know, use some common sense with this. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I, I, oftentimes I wonder if instructors are teaching their applicants about the, an aiming point versus the touchdown point too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because if you can, you know, there's lots of ways you can lose altitude, not too many ways you can gain it when you're at idle. Right. But if you can roll out on final and then kind of adjust your glide path by whatever means is necessary, because the, the ACS doesn't say specifically, they just say you've got to land on or no more than 200 feet beyond your spot um, to to keep an aiming point, which of course we know is gonna be before the touchdown point, stationary in the windscreen. And if you have a fairly good idea of how, how far the airplane is gonna float before it touches down, then this maneuver becomes infinitely easier to do. And, yeah. you know, I took your, your uh, 
advice uh, early on in my DPE career, Wally. And, and uh, it, the power of 180 is the very last landing we do, the very last landing we do. And I'll tell them, so we'll do the one at power of 180 at the, at the end, give you a little chance to kind of get a feel for the wind. And right. almost none of them take real advantage of those three opportunities, short field, soft field, and a normal landing to get a, get a feel for what that wind is doing to them. And right. so it just, it makes the power of 180 uh, almost a crapshoot. Yeah. And, um, mm. and, and it's, and it's really too bad because you're, you're giving them, basically you're giving them three chances yeah. to, to figure out, to figure out what it is. And, and the thing, you know, Wally, you said earlier about on a soft field or a short field landing, you know, you can go around and that, I mean, not, you can't do it an unlimited number of times, but you, cer you certainly go around because the ACS says recognizes the, uh, I don't remember the wording, but it's something about recognizing that things aren't going well and executes a go around if necessary. So the ACS acknowledges that you can make a go around again. It, it, it's not an unlimited number, but, right. uh, but, but you can go around that phrase, that wording is missing in the or it's not missing it's omitted intentionally on the power off 180 it's a yeah. one and done maneuver but yeah. but you know the question is well, what happens if a flock of birds flies up in front of us what happens if uh if somebody you know there's a runway incursion or a repair truck gets out on the runway or you know something that's beyond the applicant's control truly beyond the applicant's control happens and our guidance tells us that we can allow them to do it again. If it's a safety of flight issue, if there's a safe, if the safety of the landing area uh, becomes uh, in question and it's something that the, that the applicant didn't do uh, himself or herself, then we can allow them to, uh, to do it again. But, but that doesn't mean, okay, I misjudged the wind and I'm, I'm a thousand feet short of, you know, my touchdown point because I misjudged the wind. That's something that the applicant did and right. it demonstrates a lack of, of mastery of the aircraft. It's not some birds flying. I'll give you, I'll give you actually a perfect example of, of something that happened just a few weeks ago. It's a commercial ride and it's going great. I mean, it's going great. And we're in, we're in, uh, uh, left-hand traffic to runway 17 right at Hooks. And um, he asked for a short approach. And the guy said, uh, I can't let you do the sh a short approach because we've got incoming traffic or whatever. Uh, and uh, well, okay, could we have a 360 on the downwind leg? Sure. So he gave us a 360. And as we rolled out on the 360 at about midfield, the guy, the tower operator said, um, turn left, cross, cross the runway, and enter a right downwind cleared for the short approach. Well, by the time by the time he got across the runway and, and wings level, we were past the beam the numbers. And he pulled the throttle back and he said, this isn't gonna work. And I let him do it again. Why? Because the tower put him in a position that this couldn't possibly be successful. Not right. his fault. Now, right. we, can't, we made a low approach and came around and did it again. Unfortunately, he was about 100 feet short. And, yeah. you know, and I don't care how good the check ride went. It, the check ride could have been on a scale of 1 to 10. It could have been a 12. But he's yeah. 100 feet short on his short feet on his power off 180. And yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry. You know, and he knew it. And it was just that. But there's an example, yeah. a real world example of, what, you know, when we can let them do that again. But otherwise, it's a one and done deal. Right. Right. Yeah, I just wonder if now people are going to have their friends stay out next to the runway in a golf cart or something to run out there if they're a little high or a little low. Because cause Pat said, <laughs> just if. I'm kidding. Yeah. Don't do that. No matter where you're at, don't yeah. do that. <laughs> at Hooks, we'll use the turtle excuse. There's a turtle on the runway. Yeah. <laughs> or a water moccasin. One of the two. I need one of them. I want to hit either one of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, gentlemen. As always, it's a lot of fun. This is part three of now what will be a part four series because we're going to do instrument. I don't care how long it takes. We'll circle back and do instrument check rides as well. Common errors on instrument check rides in the coming week or two. Um, Pat, as always, thanks for joining the show. Wally, 
get some rest in Denver and enjoy your Hawaii trip. I know it's work, right. but it sure sounds fun. You have that a little uh, shopping trip to do for me. I hope you knock that out as well while you're out there. And uh, right. as always, everyone, fly safely and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe. Fly safe.